In the last lecture, we gave an overview of different ways of creating threads. But all of these approaches have a glaring problem when it comes to platform threads. Remember, there are two types of threads, platform threads and virtual threads. We are only talking about platform threads in this section. A platform thread is an expensive resource. By default, a single platform thread will take up about one megabytes of memory. And so this puts a limit on the number of platform threads that can be available in a JVM. So we cannot go ahead and simply create new threads as and when we please. If you think about an application server where tens of thousands of users might hit the application endpoints, if we start a new thread for every one of them, this will surely crash the server. It's not going to be a pretty sight. This is also precisely the reason we are discouraged to start our own threads. Yet another problem is that starting a platform thread will take some time, which might lead to performance issues. The solution for both the problems is to create a thread pool, and that is pretty much what every application server does. Tomcat, for example, would create 200 threads dedicated for user requests by default. This limits the number of threads that can be run inside the application server JVM and prevents the JVM from crashing. In this scenario, a user request for an application server would be handed over to another already created thread in a thread pool rather than creating a brand new one. So this definitely improves performance. Now this is where we make a fundamental shift in thinking. Instead of thinking, let's create a thread to do a particular task, we should think, let's submit a task to the thread pool. Thinking in this way allows us to separate the task from how the task will be executed. We call this the execution policy of the task. This is essentially the big idea behind Java futures. Thinking about all this in an abstract manner, here's a diagram that I have drawn. On the right, you have a dotted rectangle. That's the thread pool, which contains a number of threads based on some policy. At this point, it's not important what the policy is. A thread pool may run all tasks in a single thread, for example or a thread pool may shrink and grow depending on the number of users. Not important at this point. But how does the thread pool gets used? Other threads can submit any task for execution to this thread pool. In the diagram, you can see several callers submitting their tasks. These tasks get executed by the threads inside the thread pool. But note that after submission, the caller gets what is called as the future, which is basically a logical reference to the executing task. The task submission itself does not wait, but simply queues the request to the thread pool and returns back immediately with the future. Now, each one of these concepts require a concrete representation in Java. In terms of interfaces, we will talk about two types of tasks, which is runnable and callable. Any Java class which implements one of these Java interfaces is considered a task. They could even be Lambda functions since these interfaces are functional interfaces. We just need to make sure that these signatures match. Now, what's the interface which represents the abstraction of a thread pool? Now that's the Java executor service. The applications will use the executor service interface to submit runnable or callable tasks. Now here's how the two interfaces look, runnable and callable. Runnable, as we had talked about before, does not return any output, nor does it explicitly indicate a check exception. Callable, on the other hand, is explicit about what is being returned, 
and also the fact that it can throw an exception. In most cases, you would want to return back information after submitting a task to the executor service. And so you would mostly be using callable. Here's the interface which represents an executor service. Note here that only the most important methods are shown. The first couple of methods are about how we submit any task to this executor service. Internally, the concrete implementation of the executor service would use a thread pool to execute the task and then return a future to the caller. As far as the caller is concerned, it's not waiting for anything. It simply submits the task and gets a future object. And at some point later, it will use this future object to get the result back. But most importantly, the caller can use the future object to inspect the state of the submitted task, get the completed result, or if an exception is thrown by the task. We will get into the details later. There are also a bunch of methods to shut down the thread pool. For platform threads, this will usually happen when the JVM needs to shut down. Let's talk a little bit about these methods. The shutdown method. If you call this method, the executor service will reject all newly submitted tasks, but will still proceed with the execution of already submitted tasks. Note that this method will not wait for all tasks to complete. Rather, it'll just return immediately. Shutdown now method. If you call this method, then the executor service will attempt to stop all executing tasks by sending interrupts to them. Remember, interrupts are the preferred mechanism by which to stop threads. Waiting tasks will not be processed. The close method. Basically, this will shut down the service, but also wait for all of the tasks to complete. Note here that the executor service interface also implements auto-closable, which means if you wrap executor service in a try with resources block, then the close method will be automatically called. We will frequently see this in action when we use virtual threads. And in many cases, when we are using executor service, this will be the basis for structured concurrency. If you're wondering what the future interface looks like, here it is. As mentioned before, a future represents a future result of an asynchronous task. So using this future reference, we should be able to get the result, any errors, or even cancel the task if needed. That's precisely what you see as part of the interface. First couple of methods are used to get the result of the task. The get methods essentially wait till the result is available. There is a timeout version of the get as well, which waits for the maximum specified time. Very good idea to use that. The next few methods are basically to get the result or exception if you already know if the task has completed successfully or failed. So these methods actually don't wait. There is a cancel method which will remove the task from the queue if it's not already executing. If you send true as a parameter, then the service will attempt to cancel the request by sending an interrupt if it is running. Be aware that for the interrupt to work, the task needs to be written so that it will check the interrupted status and exit gracefully. The next few methods are to inquire on the computation state of the task. The task could be in one of the states, running or success, which means it has completed successfully, fail, which means it has completed with an exception, or cancel. The state method will return the status of the task. There is also an ease cancel method to check if the task was canceled. Knowing all this about the interfaces, 
we will redraw the abstract diagram to include the responsibilities of the Java interfaces. Now you can see that the executor service is responsible for the management of the threat pool. The caller will simply submit a task to the service either using a runnable task or a callable task. As mentioned before, the submit method will not wait for the task to complete but return a future object which the caller can use to inquire or cancel the task. The diagram now looks pretty straightforward. With this particular insight now solidified in our brains, let's look at some examples to make it crystal clear. Let's do that in the next lecture.